is this Two Trees TS3 laser engraver powerful enough to be useful, but safe enough to be used indoors? In some ways, yes, but in other ways, I've got some feedback. A laser cutter or engraver can be an excellent tool to complement your 3D printer and help you make more. A while ago, I documented my journey in buying and upgrading a large Chinese CO2 laser that I'm quite happy with. As that video shows, however, there are a lot of K40s of mixed quality to choose from and plenty of fakes, not to mention the size of some units is beyond what some people can fit. I personally think the opportunity exists for an indoor desktop laser engraver and that's where the Two Trees TS3 comes in. I've rejected reviewing a lot of diode lasers because of safety, but I decided to give this machine a punt after viewing this page initially. Looking a lot like a K40 in form, the TS3 is fully enclosed and has safety features such as inbuilt smoke filtration and the appropriately tinted cover so glasses aren't needed for normal operation. It also has a flame detection alarm that can cut off the machine if the material catches on fire. Two Trees ran a Kickstarter for this machine, which was successful, and now there's a pre-order button where the current price is $840. US This 10 watt model was provided free of charge for testing by Two Trees after they agreed to my review policy and a very stern warning that I would test it quite thoroughly as I had with other laser diodes in the past. This is a pre-production version, and as you'll see, some bits could definitely do with improvement. So on to unboxing. The machine arrived without damage, potentially because it's double boxed. Inside the top cover, we have an instruction manual as well as an FAQ sheet, which we'll look at in more detail shortly. Encased in plenty of protective foam, we have the actual laser engraver. Once you wrestle off all of the foam, the actual setup is straightforward. This job largely consists of peeling off protective film and removing foam and cable ties that stop the machine from moving during transit. Also included in the packaging are the mains power cable, a USB cable, a set of safety goggles, a laptop style 24 volt power brick, and some basic tools, including those for focusing, which we'll look at later. The final steps were to remove the protective film from the window and also the protective film from the touch LCD. However, this didn't come off cleanly with the little snippets left in the corner resulting in very erratic performance and an offset from where I pressed. After pulling out the touchscreen so I could remove every last bit of plastic, the touchscreen started to work normally and hasn't been a problem since. On the SD card, we have a test file as well as two G-code files for initiating the machine for different modes. And then inside the main folder, we have the product manual. And I'd say for the most part, this is a pretty good document. It explains how to focus the laser, has a page on each of the various software options, how to change the configuration of the machine, as well as some servicing. There's a few dodgy translations, but overall it's quite useful. We have a folder for each of the software options available, the USB driver, a digital copy of the FAQ page, which complements the manual, and finally some folders with videos. These cover various functions, such as how to switch from the flatbed to the rotary module. I did have some more significant issues at the start, such as a misaligned and loose belt that would drift out of position and get caught between the roller and the V-slot extrusion. Mechanically, I found the machine really needed a once over. The grub screws needed to be loosened on the pulleys so they could be slid into proper alignment with the belts. The V-roller tension was way too loose all around the machine and I couldn't even home because the end stop plate had moved out of alignment causing the machine to grind and shudder. More quality control needed because I couldn't proceed until all of this was fixed. Off to an awkward start, so let's hope this improves for the production versions. Before we go over my tests, let's look at the available software options. There's quite a few ways to control the machine, and we'll start with the touchscreen. We can manually turn the laser on and off to various intensities. We can hard home the machine back to the upper left. You can then manually move the laser head into a set position before setting this as the work origin. And from the engrave menu, you can see all of the files on the SD card. After you select a file, you have a frame button, which will get the laser to trace an outline of the shape, just to ensure that it's gonna fit on your material before you start the job. In the tool menu, we have a button for Wi-Fi, which is a welcome addition, apart from the fact that you have to reconnect it every time the machine is powered on. After you enter your password and get the machine connected to the network, you can enter the IP address into your browser and you'll get the same controls as you get from the touchscreen. 
I didn't really use this because unless the computer is in front of the machine, it's a little bit useless. Another wireless option I was quite excited about was the MKS Laser app for Android. I was able to connect to the machine, manually control it and set the start position. And I enjoyed the idea of a creation mode where you could create artwork directly on the phone, but anytime I went to upload it, I got an error. I also tried to process one of the photos on my phone. It sliced okay, but again, gave me an error when I tried to upload. The last thing I tried was to start an SD card job remotely, but this actually reset the machine completely. Onto the tethered options, and fortunately they both work well. Laser Gerbil has the same basic functions as the LCD touchscreen, and allows the importing of SVG vectors or raster images, and all we need to do is set our quality, and then our speed, power and size, before the preview is shown, and we can hit go to stream the file. This software is rather simplistic, but it is completely free. Lightburn is software that has a free trial, but is paid for the full version. Again, we can control the laser manually, and for raster images, we can set up the same parameters before starting the job. However, in Lightburn, it's a lot easier to position and see how big the object is compared to the laser bed. We also have more control with the starting point and work coordinates. When working with vector graphics, it also has the huge advantage that you can set up different line work to different colors and then alter the cutting parameters for each. This means within the same file, some parts could be engraved, whereas other parts could be cut through. One more thing about the testing, and that's a quick look at the focusing system. As the beam comes out, it converges from a wide point to a very narrow one, and this narrowest focal point is where the laser is at its smallest and most powerful. Positioning the workpiece on this is extremely important. Have it too far away, and the spot will be big and weak. Too close will have the same effect, but if we find that Goldilocks zone right in the middle, we'll get the best results possible. The height of the laser head can be lifted or lowered by turning the knob on top, the focal length for this laser is 50 millimeters. And to achieve that, we have these four metal cushion blocks, when all stacked together, add up to 50 millimeters. For engraving, we stack them all on top of each other and lower the laser down until the tip is touching the top of the cushion blocks. That's fine for engraving the surface, but when we're cutting through materials, our requirements change. The beam will be focused on the top of the part, but wide and weak on the underside, meaning it's hard to cut the whole way through. So what we really want is a compromise where the strongest point of the laser is in the middle of the material. And that's why there's multiple cushion blocks. If we're looking to cut a 2 mil thick material, we want our focal length to be 49 millimeters and we can leave out one of the 1 millimeter blocks. This works well on paper, but in practice is quite fiddly and it would be easy to drop some of the blocks. So I jumped onto Onshape and modeled up these various spaces. I printed enough variations to suit different materials and they're just a little bit bigger and easier to hold, and I'm absolutely certain there's much less chance of me misplacing them. The original system does work, but it's just a little bit fiddly, so I prefer to use these. How about some performance testing, starting with engraving? When it comes to engraving, this product performs well across a range of materials. The first job I ran was the demo file already on the SD card, not particularly exciting, but confirmation that the machine was actually working. So we know we can engrave onto cardboard, so let's move on to something more exciting. Next up was the pirate ship graphic from the SD card, prepared in laser gerbil. This one was prepared with the manual's recommended settings of 6000mm per minute at 50% power. This combination of settings meant a job time of approximately 20 minutes. Next, I took a screen cap of my favourite droid builder, Sam Prentice, and applied the same settings but with a darker piece of plywood. We can see the wood grain is far more prominent on this piece, and that diminishes the clarity of the image, but does give an interesting effect. This bark texture was engraved onto MDF, with the same settings, but this time processed in light burn. And once more, I think the result is quite good. I tried some cork, which engraved too well, so I had to turn down the power and turn up the speed. Cork is suitable for engraving, but I'd say I'd have to turn things down a little bit more for better results. One thing I was keen to try was a ceramic bathroom tile, and this turned out extremely well. The engraving isn't particularly deep, but it does feel quite robust and gives a stunning effect. The manual talks about engraving stainless steel, but quite frankly that's misleading. I got myself a cheap stainless steel cleaver from the dollar store, and as expected, trying to engrave directly onto the surface does absolutely nothing. So I purchased a can of moly dry film lubricant, which is known to help with this situation. To use this, you spray it onto the surface, give it an hour to dry, and then place it in the machine. It will then react with the laser to leave the pattern behind. 
Afterwards, it's clear where the engraving took place. And from this point, we need to use isopropyl alcohol to remove the Molly Dry film. This first attempt was a little bit faint, so I repeated the process on the other slide, slowing down the feed rate, and that gave me a much cleaner result. Last up was blue acrylic, which left a faint indentation. More on the settings for this later. Success as far as I'm concerned, without feeling that any of the jobs took too long to complete. When it comes to cutting, however, the TS3 starts to struggle. I decided I needed a laser cut potato from cardboard, and luckily there was a great one on Thingiverse. I used the old free Autodesk software called Slicer for Fusion. Using this program, you can take a solid 3D model and convert it into a range of configurations, with what you're seeing here being interlocking pieces. It then outputs a file suitable for laser cutting, and even includes animated step-by-step -step instructions on how to put your object together. I've got a video on this which is linked below. I cut the potato pieces from 3mm cardboard, which cut the pieces out fairly cleanly, with some still needing a little jiggling to get them free. Cardboard potato assembled, so onto some harder tests. The manual concentrates on plywood and acrylic, so I did the same. Plywood's tricky because the glue that binds the layers together interferes with the laser and can make it difficult to cut. With this in mind, I tried various brands and thicknesses. I try to be really thorough with my testing, so let me explain what I do. I start by trying to cut a simple rectangle that goes off the side of the piece. And my first attempt is with the power, speed and passes that the manufacturer recommends. By running the rectangle off the edge, it's easy to see how much penetration the laser had. I'll then increase the power, decrease the speed or increase the number of passes until I can finally get through the material. I'll also experiment with focal length to see if that makes a difference. When I have some settings that look like they're going to work, I cut a more indicative shape in the centre of the piece. For these tests, a spur gear. For 3mm plywood, the manufacturer claim is one pass at 700mm per minute. But I was only barely breaking through after slowing the speed to 500 and doing 8 passes. This 4mm plier went a little bit better, not with the manufacturer settings, but it wasn't too long until I could break through. The required setting being 300 millimeters per minute, but four passes instead of the quoted one. Keep in mind that this is mostly through, but it's still going to need to cut the last fibers to be able to clear the piece. The manual claims that this machine can cut through eight millimeter plywood, which in my experience for a diode laser is extremely difficult. Well, this plywood was thinner, being only seven millimeters, and at the recommended setting, the laser barely touched it. I increased the amount of passes in an attempt to make a dent, but as you can see, although the laser is penetrating a little bit further each time, it's also badly burning the top surface, in my opinion making the part worthless, so I gave up there. Disappointing, but not surprising. MDF wasn't listed, but I tried it anyway, and it proved the same as a thick ply, catching on fire before it could burn through cleanly. Cork proved particularly flammable, and I couldn't really cut it without the surface catching on fire, so I abandoned it too. Leftover packaging foam cuts extremely well, in fact I had to keep on turning down the power so it wouldn't completely melt the foam. In the end I found a setting that went through fairly cleanly, but a scalpel would still be needed to cut the final piece free. Finally some 3mm red acrylic, which should be more predictable than plywood. Again the manufacturer's claim of a single 200mm per minute pass was hugely optimistic, but by increasing the amount of passes I managed to break through, albeit with some tiny portions that weren't quite clean meaning a bit of force was required to snap the part out of the sheet. So cutting performance, not so hot. Onto the final feature, the rotary axis. This machine has a very welcome extra feature. If we remove the honeycomb bed and unscrew the four bolts holding in the lower floor panels, these can be removed to reveal a rotary axis. We configure the machine for this by running the use rotary NC file on the SD card and switching the dial on the back from one to two. Now all movements will control the X axis, but the rotary axis instead of Y. At first I didn't really have much to work with, so I started with a toilet paper roll. It's actually too small in diameter to get the laser low enough to achieve the 50mm required for focal length. But even so, I was able to run a job and verify that everything was working. The laser's out of focus, so it looks strange, but it's enough to continue with. I purchased a cheap insulated coffee mug with a stainless steel section that I sprayed the dry molly lube onto. It really wasn't stable, so I padded one end with some foam and some Velcro, which seemed to do the trick. I prepared the job with the same settings I did for the cleaver, and achieved a pretty good result, apart from the mug shifting partway through the job. 
I also experimented with a glass container, as seen on the instructional video on the SD card, and predictably the diode laser just goes straight through the surface without having any effect. Cue a rerun after the application of some spray on dry moly lube, which definitely marked the surface in a durable way, but as you can see, the glass container must have been sliding all over the place. The rollers are a soft foam, but I guess they still don't have enough traction. When you want to switch back to normal operation, we put the dial back to 1 and run the use Y axis file from the SD card. For me, the rotary axis is a tick, assuming your object isn't too slippery. I have some mixed thoughts about this machine, so here's a summary. In some ways, this machine comes across as a well-developed, refined product. It certainly looks the part, but in other ways, it's clear there's not enough attention to detail. I think it's fair that some adjustment would be needed after shipping, but in my opinion, the initial problems I had with the assembly are beyond that. Some of the translations are quite sloppy, spelling carve correctly in some places, then spelling it as cavra in others, and perhaps most amusingly, spelling it as craving in a third place. Having to search for and retype in the password for your Wi-Fi network every time the machine is booted is also a major oversight. As for the safety features, they're welcome but again could use a little refinement. The lid does a great job filtering out the laser and 99% of the time you use the machine, you don't need the included laser glasses. This is a huge step up on an open frame machine. The edge of the lid is lined in this thick brush to try and seal in the smoke. And behind the back cover, we can see the filtration system. These cotton filters are consumables and meant to be replaced every three months. The filtration got rid of most of the smoke smell, but not quite enough for my liking, and I had to run the machine outside because I was getting a sore throat. I understand they're updating the design, so the user can run a vent outside to get rid of the smoke that way. It's also worth noting that there's no safety switch on the lid, which means the laser power isn't cut out when the lid is opened mid-job. The flame detection system is definitely a good idea. If you get your settings wrong, resulting in the work material catching on fire, the machine will be automatically stopped with a warning message. However, I noticed after moving the machine outside that the warning would be running constantly, even without anything being cut. After some trial and error, I was able to work out what the problem was. The sensor that detects the flame can also be triggered by sunlight, so I had to cover it over for my own sanity. When it comes to performance in terms of engraving at least, I really don't have any complaints. When it comes to cutting however, I was skeptical of the claimed performance and my testing confirmed this. I don't think diode lasers are really that suitable for most cutting jobs. CO2 lasers such as a K40 are so much more powerful and faster for cutting through plywood. If you mainly want to cut rather than engrave, they're a much better choice than a diode laser. Also keep in mind that the wavelength of a diode laser will not interact with transparent materials such as glass or acrylic. These three pieces were all done with the same G-code, and on the clear piece, the only thing you see is evidence of the hexagon bed getting hot and melting the underside of the acrylic. This blue acrylic absorbs the blue light and makes the engraving effect very subtle, whereas the same power on the black acrylic is probably twice as deep. Fortunately, none of this matters if you intend to use this machine at what it's best at, and that is engraving images onto the surface of suitable materials. Or engraving with the rotary axis, which really adds value and is a welcome addition. So far, two trees have been very welcoming of my feedback, so let's hope that some improvements make it into the production versions that greet customers. That's my opinion, but I'd love to know yours after seeing my experience, so please let me know in the comments section. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, Happy laser engraving. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.